Yes. Let's have our conversation, Jay. You're ready, aren't you? I'm ready. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, if you're home, wherever you are, this morning I present to you Mr. Alexander Segbefia. Now, he's a Ghanaian lawyer. I, I like the, the contrast, the fact that he was a lawyer and mm -hmm. became health minister. Yeah. Like, you need some double brain to be that. Oh, yes. yes. You, you and then quite a lot of knowledge. Absolutely. <laughs> now, he was a deputy chief of staff during ex-president, uh, his old rest in peace, Mills government. And also, he also served as a minister of health under the John Dramani Mahama administration. Now, uh, I'm curious to talk to this man because mm -hmm. we're, we're in the era where health is a huge conversation. Mm, yes, exactly. All right, yes. And the fact that he also belongs to the biggest decision party, uh, they probably hold a different views and all of that. He's here. Why am I even starting the conversation mm -hmm. on my own? Honor to have you here in the studio this morning. Thank you very much. Good morning to both of you, Jay and MFA. Um, Thank my you. My pleasure for inviting me over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, and of course, good morning to your viewers. Right. Thank now, you. Now, you don't want to start on a well, very, 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 start off a with very light note. And yeah. I've been thinking for some man who is a lawyer, mm. who served as deputy uh, chief of staff, who served, the one that, that amazes me, the one that I'm in awe of, is the fact that you served as health minister. Can you tell me your journey? Well, I started off as campaign coordinator for the NDC when we were in opposition. And uh, when we won the election, I then became the deputy chief of staff for a four-year period. And then uh, when we lost Professor Mills and but were able to win the next election, uh, I took a lull for a while and then I came in as deputy defense minister. So I actually was in the defense ministry wow. for a while. And actually when Ebola was at its rage, I was actually in the defense ministry and we had to play a part with regard to the construction of uh, isolation centers, okay, etc. Okay. And then from there, I uh, was promoted to become the Minister of Health by His Excellency John Dramani Mahama. And so I was uh, the Minister of Health for close or just over 18 months. Mm. But people seem to think I was there for four years. I actually wasn't. <laughs> uh, but I was there for 18 months. And it was a, an interesting journey. Um, with the exception of, say, the Attorney General's position, actually, for most ministries, when you think about it laterally, they are management jobs. Right. So yes, if you have some expertise in that area, it helps. But it is not, if you've been in management and you've managed things for quite a while in your life, then you just bring the same skills to bear. And for the health ministry, it's actually quite useful because when you put a doctor in, then the pharmacists become upset. <laughs> if you put a nurse in, then the doctors, the doctors and this become yeah. upset. If you put in, so depending on which profession you take and put in the ministry, and when I say upset, I mean it in a light way. Right. There's some jostling and there's, there's, there's a suspicion of favoritism. But I'm a lawyer, so I have no uh, link with any of the players within the, the health sector. So everybody feels free to think that, well, they can approach me. And you also look at it very dispassionately. You look at it not with regard to, I have to be careful what I do on this occasion because I come from a particular fraternity. You just do it objectively and do what is best for the country and what is needed at the time mm -hmm. without fear or favor, uh, one way or the other. So actually, it's a good thing. So long as you have, uh, with management, the thing is you need uh, a lot of people skills and management skills and if you have that, then uh, you, you can weather the storm. But it is a very, one of the more difficult jobs in uh, gov okay. governance. Well, I'll come back to how you grew up, your education and all of that. I still mm. want to stay here slightly mm. as somebody who's been in health ministry uh, or in even governance before. Would you say personally you're impressed at the way the certain governments are dealing with the uh, COVID-19 issue in this county, would you say? I don't think that I'm here going to mark them. Anything I say is taking, going to be taken with a pinch of salt. Right. What I'll do is I'll tell you about things that have been done which are useful, and then I'll tell you about things which uh, could have been done differently or better. Okay. And then I'll leave the audience to make up their mind. Okay, but I anything I say, you, you will be taken with a pinch of salt or do say, look, because you come from the NDC. And I think that we have to try to move away from the NDC and MPP politics to a certain extent um, on this particular issue because actually <laughs> when if it gets bad it has no exactly. political color I mean you exactly it just hits everybody so 
I'll dodge that question for now. <laughs> Well, but, uh, but I've, I've been listening to you for some time, and you yes. have the view that your delayed infrastructure, your delayed structures out, especially template that you used in fighting the Ebola, you thought would have been adopted to use today. This is this is. My view is that it's not the policies that the government has put in place. Okay. It's when they put them in place. So, um, the COVID team has put out two documents already to the government, giving some various advice. And we're happy to see that a lot of the recommendations that were put forward by us, right. as well as our flag bearer, uh, our presidential candidate, His Excellency John Dramania, have been picked up and done by government. What the issue has been with us is simply that the timing mm -hmm. of the implementation has caused us some concern. So... What are some examples, if you might? I talked, and the president talked about masks for four or five weeks before masks became something that you should do. This should have been done from the beginning. And actually, because you can locally produce, there's a difference between the professional mask, which you're wearing in mine, and there's a difference between homemade. And the education on it has also been not the best. If you go around telling people wear masks because it protects you, what you're saying in actual fact is that everybody should get a professional mask like I'm wearing and you're wearing. Because these this professional ones, you, when it's very difficult for something to enter it, and it's also very difficult for you to let it go. If you have a homemade mask, it does less of getting people of you inhaling because it's not been done in a way which technically protects you. So you can still get it, but it's more difficult for you to transmit mm. because once you're wearing the mask, if you cough, you shout, you do anything, it stays within your environment. So when I wear a homemade mask, what I'm telling you is that I love you enough and I'm protecting you from me. Now, if you love me to wear one, <laughs> so in that case, I can give it to you, but you can't give it to me on the homemade mask. On the professional mask you're wearing now, either way, you can't give it to me and you can't get it because they are designed that way. But then they are disposable. So unless you have enough money to be buying them at a, a certain rate, you have to get rid of them. So the education should be that, look, because there's a less risk factor in the general environment of you getting it as opposed to working in a hospital or dealing with people who potentially have it where you need the professional ones. Mm. If everybody's wearing a homemade mask, all it does is to stop spread. So if I didn't have the mask on and I'm talking, most likely the droppers to get as far as you will hang in them. But once I'm here and I'm talking, it all stays with me. It rests on my clothes. So if I don't have it, I'm fine. But if I have it, it doesn't get to you. So it's actually for your protection. And we haven't done that piece of education. So actually, if I went into a public transport and somebody wasn't wearing a mask, and I'm upset because I'm, I'm protecting him, but he's not protecting me. That is the bottom line of homemade mask, unlike the professional mask. Then when people purchase homemade mask, the professional ones are packaged by machines. Nobody ever touches them till they go into the plastic and I see it. So you can take it out of the plastic and put it on. That's not the same with homemade mask. They're most likely put in by somebody's hand. So you never wear a homemade mask or a non-professional mask without washing it. When you buy it, you must wash it first, preferably with a little bit of detergent and uh, disinfectant. Dry it in the sun, iron it, you're good to go. So End of day, wash it again, use it again. Because you're not in an environment which is high risk per se. So it's dependent on the risk on what you use and what you wear, but they are necessary. And everybody should be wearing a mask. We said this one. So this one example okay. of what we said, which should have been done much earlier, and is now being done. So it's a good policy. And we are glad the government has picked up on it and it's making it, has made it compulsory now. But we could have done this four weeks ago. But let, let me push you a, a bit, a bit more. Still on the same point on timing. Yes. Um, th I'm very sure there is, th th there is an incubation period for that, for the thoughts, the idea, yeah. and then there's also implementation. So um, it's one thing. Wouldn't it be one thing for you to mention it? Of course, it will have to go through a process because I'm very sure funds will have to be released, like how about ten million dollars or so in, uh, in excess has been pumped Pro into the production of uh, locally PPEs. produced. So is, isn't there a certain incubation period? So would you just stand on the ground? So to were say they preparing that for mask four weeks before it came? That's, that's what I'm asking. So there's no incubation period. You, from the, the incubation period starts from when you make the policy. Okay. So we lost four weeks. Look, let me give you another example. 
this disease was never going to come from within. It was always going to be imported. You don't have to wait for a certain number to come in to shut down. You either decide my neighbor has got it, so I'm shutting down now, or the moment the first case comes in, you shut down, at least the international borders. Because if we are in, our, in the environment we are in now, we still can do our business. You can't travel. People can't come in. But if you're shut down earlier, the numbers would not be what it is. We and certain people say, oh, no. But look, it, 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 you can't do that. We are international trade and everybody else. What, what is everybody? We, are, we, are our, we, we make decisions for our people. Some people took hard decisions like that. Shut down. If you have shut down from the moment they came back from the trip mm -hmm. in Europe. And we found out that the, is it the Danish ambassador and one other had got the ailment. Around that time, we should have shut down international borders. We wouldn't have had the need to even do technically, local but some, some of the some of the cases were recorded, uh, you know, and as, that was as that a result of persons who had illegal entry routes into the country, not necessarily you from never, airports. All these steps we are taking, washing hands, mask, is it a cure? What, the preventive measure? It's a preventive measure. Mm -hmm. So we are talking of preventive measures in general. And I'm saying, if you had done that steps, it would have been more of a preventive measure early. When the lockdown came, people have been saying lockdown, lockdown, lockdown. Fantastic. A lockdown. There are a number of things you have to do with a lockdown. One is enhanced testing. We didn't get to that stage till possibly the latter part of the two weeks. So we lost time there. But more importantly, the way we did the lockdown was also an issue. I believe, or we thought, that the lockdown was in, they involved two things. Okay. One was to lock down the, the, the space. Nobody comes in and out of Accra. Nobody comes in and out of Kumasi. Nobody comes in and out of Kaswa. That's one lockdown. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Then we had another lockdown, which was you cannot move in, stay home. You cannot go. So it's actually two in one. Uh -huh. The first one should have been immediate. On the day he made the announcement, they shouldn't have even given 24 hours. You, people will say, oh, it's, it's, this is leadership. But don't you think that a consensus would be also people's welfare? And I mean, you are in Ga Accra. We are in Ghana. Because you, clearly so you make provisions for schools to have dormitory-style sleeping. You make provision for people who have to get out, can't get out. But all these but things are processes that might take a while. I mean, not, not no. to say we disagree, but just, just to get well, information out Well, it's a question of, of yeah. we are at 4,700. Mm -hmm. The choice is yours. But this uh, is 4, and You see, this is why I'm saying that. We all have different views. And yeah. okay. people can disagree. Yeah. But for our, some of us, our views, you could have given us that 48 hours to go and do the shopping and everything within Accra. But we should have stopped people from leaving Accra and Kumasi on the day that it was announced there was a lockdown. Because what happened was that that two days, nobody, anybody who didn't want to be under a lockdown provision left town. Now it's in other regions. We are now beginning to get the numbers increasing in the other regions. But, but and it's a direct think, result. Don't you think to mobilize, to mobilize all the resources, I mean, to make provision for relief packages, stimulus packages, and all these things, which, would, which I think uh, partly the, the minority has actually criticized government for wrong protocols observed in some of these things. Don't you think some of these things would take time? Hence the need for things like 24 hours to be able to execute some of these Why things. Why do we Just make asking. excuses okay. for lack of proactiveness? All along, we have been reactive. We heard about it in January. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying government is uh, the only one responsible. Many governments have the problem. The fact that many people have the problem does not make your position right. That's not the, the, the basis of it. We've had Ebola in the past. It never came in. But we knew what happened and how it happened. When we left office, the Interministerial, interministerial Committee that existed for Ebola was still running at the point when we left office. It was being chaired by my deputy, uh, Victor Bampo, and all the others were still running it. We had a dedicated office for emergency issues like this. What happened since we left office? Has it, it went into disuse. So basically, when this thing came back, we had to now go back, dust the books, and say, well, as it was meant to be a permanent thing, that should go, be ongoing. 
So that when we get a disease like this, mm -hmm. we had 40 something odd people who had been trained with regard to the use of taking off PPEs who went to the Ebola countries. Yeah. They came back. They were used for part of the training of staff here. And it was, a, if you look at the manual, there's supposed to be like every quarter, every six months, there's supposed to be a training, this thing. Every hospital should have an isolated place where if you get an illness, you send it to. It's all there. It was left into disuse. So when we say that it, they are not being proactive, it's now you have to now go and dust, read who was in charge, who is doing this, who is that. That should have already been in place. Then we would have been in a better position to deal with it. So my position is not that what steps government took was wrong. No. Right. The steps, but the timing and how we let things go into disuse. Mm -hmm. So you have a bank hospital. You don't open it. Ebola comes. Uh, sorry. Uh, COVID, COVID comes. comes. And then we need centers. So all of a sudden you realize that we need that center. Mm -hmm. Somebody even goes as far as opening his mouth to say, excuse my French. I, I, I digress. Saying to us that not open his mouth, saying to us that this is for VIPs. Forget that. You still open it. You have to use the center at uh, the medical center in Legon. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a medical center with an ICU in West Africa that is as top grade as that one. I see. I was the Minister of Health. No, it's a top grade ICU. Why we are not using it up to be COVID-19? beats my mind. But hey, let's drop that. Should I be able to blame you, um, <laughs> government? You I mean, go you, to you, you are health, so not yeah. to, not to uh, tap too much of energy no, in you. But I'm, in Le in Le I, I'm, I'm talking about reactions from center. reactions from, uh, yeah, well, yes. <laughs> from governments, sitting yeah. government, past governments, previous yeah. past governments, yeah. and all previous past, past, past governments. Yeah. Let's take an issue like, um, like uh, the, the doing so. It yeah. was, it's been a conversation that we know we're going to hit a power crisis. Yeah. There's increase in population. There's mm -hmm. demand for the power supply. Mm -hmm. It was coming, but it happened. So those, these things are things, aren't these things things you can't almost avoid? The, uh, the, 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 you see, the, the process of governance is problem solving. Okay. When you're putting government, it's the, the point is that there are problems going to come at you every day. And it's your duty as government mm. to solve them. But what I found interesting about the narrative mm -hmm. from president, vice president, and everyone is they went on the defensive, immediately be thinking, let me ask a question. All of a sudden, we are so, during the doom soft, which was used as an example by uh, the vice president, did the other side who were in opposition at that time ever give one piece of credit for any work that had been done by the government at the time? Not, not that I can recount. You, you won't find one. But this is not new. No, so, but, but the point is, we have set up a COVID team, mm -hmm. and we have given documentations. And even as I sit here, mm -hmm. I'm telling you what points are. I'm trying to be, do constructive criticism. I'm not saying you have done this. I'm not, I'm not being pernickety. I'm telling you what could have been done. Before. But I've also said, your policies that you are putting are good. They would never say it. And this is the difference between us and them. Excuse me, now I'm going into the difference. <laughs> and I'm doing it because if you want to throw a stone, know where to throw it and when. Because you are sitting, they have never, ever given credit for anything which, whether you brought Doomso as a, a, an example, it's a bad example. Because at the end of the day, you're comparing apples with yam. It's not even a case of apples with pear where they are both fruit. It's not. But putting that there, when that was going on, what positive steps? Even when Ebola came on, the statement was, you better not bring it into our country. I mean, why? And now all of a sudden, we are supposed to be the worst because we have given constructive criticism of steps. When they've done things right and we're giving credit, we, we say, We've said, look, we put forward policies. You've taken them. We are grateful. Yesterday, the president did something which we've been asking for for a while, which was good. He said, Friday, this was the number. This was the positivity. Okay. Saturday, this was the number. This is the positivity. Sunday, this is the number. This is the positivity. We've been asking for that for a while. But in fairness to him, he said, look, because there's a backlog, mm -hmm. we can't do it. But if there's a backlog, 
and you're not able to put them properly, then don't be, you shouldn't let your people come and talk about pigs. Because you don't, it means that your figures are not correct or they are not in a position to make that type of analysis. Now that you are giving us daily figures, mm. after two weeks, you'll be able to draw a proper or plot some proper graph because we know what is happening per day. If you look at the stats, when I listen to him, just roughly, 5,200 and something odd on Friday, 251 of them positive. That's about 4.7%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Next day, less tested, 2,250 odd tested, but 266 positive. That takes to 11.8% of that. The third day, Sunday, more tested, 3,045, I think, something like that. 160 tested. You are now back to 5.2%. If you take the whole overall, which is 160,501, against the 4,700, you are at a percentage of 2.9. So even based on that, if the average for the whole period is 2.9, but you are at 4 point something percent, 11 percent, you are nowhere near a peak. In fact, your thing is actually going up. Actually going so. Up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll have to hold an with explanation you. to that. I mean, we'll, that we'll the information minister given an explanation to that. When we come back, but I really I want to focus. Yeah. I'll go for a break. When we come back, we'll talk about <laughs> you. <laughs> now, so I'm quite curious about your teenage age. I mean, I've, I, I didn't mean to spike you up on what's happening, but I just wanted to no, uh, get into okay. your mind as a, as a health minister once before. And sure. So I, I'm glad. I really would love to explain that bit, but now I'm off. Well, you can, we, you can explain it. I know about the numbers <laughs> and whatnot, but, but uh, we'll come back to that. Don't yeah, worry. Let's yes, deal with it. Yes. Uh, uh, tell me about your teenage age. Huh. Um, <laughs> I had the fortune of going to one of the better secondary schools in Ghana, uh, Achimoto Secondary School. Oh. Hmm. When um, I keep telling them, they don't listen to one And uh, Achimoto School, isn't it? Yeah, that's you know, three yeah. goals to nail. <laughs> and that was good. Okay. Um, I spent seven years there. And actually, and I should mention my primary school, which is Christ the King. I went to Christ the King. Oh. Mm -hmm. And then from Christ the King to Ashimota. And uh, I remember in our year in Christ the King, we had a gentleman who I think went to Prempre. Yeah, he did. KK Amankwa, a good friend of mine. He topped the whole of Ghana and West Africa. Wow. Oh. In common entrance in those days. And uh, I think he had 328s, and the next person to him was about 321. So he was way out there. Hmm. And then from there, I went to Achimota. And your youthful years shape your life a lot. Because wh wh I was baptized in ARS Church, Apostles of Revelation Society, which, of which my dad was a member at the time. But I went to Catholic primary school. My mother was Baptist, so I went to Baptist church. Hmm. And we went to, a, in, in a secondary school, we had a non-denominational church service. So you, they put all of us together. And so I had had the um, education of seeing different religions and how they are taught and it shaped my view about religion. And how, at the end of the day, it's your personal relationship with God that actually matters. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily which, and you have yeah, to be able to also to, yeah. disagree with your church on some things, but have the general idea that at least for the generality of what they are doing, I can be part of that. So, and my mom was extremely religious, okay. but not in a way where she rammed it down your throat. So she made you find yourself within the way she prayed and the way she lived her life, more so than my dad. My dad was a full-fledged politician. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to remember him saying to my mom one day when the issue happened, and she, he said, oh, look, I wish I can go back to my hometown and deal with this issue. And my mom said, oh, Fred, don't do that. I mean, really. Just pray to God, and he says, ah, this is your God. We like him, but he works too slowly. <laughs> <laughs> he was a one-touch man, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so you, you had the benefit of all these issues in your life as you grew up. When I finished uh, secondary school in Ghana, I went to um, London. I didn't get the grades I wanted to, and I was bent on reading law. 
Okay. So I retook some exams again in you know, my A-levels in London, and then I went into Essex University, and I read law in Essex. And that was also a different experience. I used to be a very, well, I shouldn't blow my, I used it's to play okay. football well. Okay. And I used to play hockey. Okay. Actually, when I left Ghana, I had been called to the Ghana under-21 hockey team. Wow. Because we'd actually played our intercourse in Tamale, and the teams were being picked from them. Unfortunately, I had to leave. But what was interesting was when I went to London, I couldn't play hockey. Because it was so cold that when you had the stick in your hand, wow. yes. and you tried to whack with the ball, the vibration, Shins even with there. gloves, it's yeah. so... I immediately left hockey okay. and concentrated more on football. football. And so I played football right through university, and even after university, formed teams, played with some. Uh, fortunately, in those days when we, um, I put up the team, we had a lot of people from Ghana and Nigeria who couldn't play professional football mm -hmm. over there, but were professionals in Ghana. So the likes of Bismarck Odoi, even uh, the Ga Lache, uh, in those days when he was in London, played with our team. Uh, Junior Agogo played with our team late. Unfortunately, he's passed. But he was a very young boy in those days when we played. So football was a passion that I, I always had wow. and have. Um, and then I was called to the bar, obviously, and then I started practicing. But I practiced as a lawyer, mm -hmm. predominantly in the criminal field. I was a prosecutor. Okay. And I prosecuted in, I rose to the rank of a borough crime prosecutor. They wanted to make me a chief crime prosecutor on a number of occasions, and I refused, because if I had taken it, I would have been compelled to apply for a British passport and take it. Okay. But I always had the view that I was going to come back home and play politics, so oh. I wasn't interested in getting a British passport. So I ended up being in charge of the largest unit in London, which was actually bigger than some uh, counties that I had to, if I'd been promoted, they would have been even smaller because I was in charge of Westminster and the city of London, one square mile. We dealt with loss of the fraud and also the British Chancel Police for the whole of London. So I had 120 lawyers under me, wow. 120 staff, 60 of them lawyers, 60 of them administration. Um, when I acted you, up for... When you let go of that opportunity yeah. and then decide to, you know, focus more on being I Detroit, always I had the, the, <laughs> the, the belief that when you work at a very high level, you then totally understand what we call uh, platinum ceilings. You realize that as a, as a black person working in that environment, you had to be twice as good than the next person to get the job or to be promoted simply because if you were on par, you were not the person who was going to get it. Okay. So it made you realize where you stood and what you did. And okay. if you have some level of pride, then it means that it's not always about the money. Uh, it's about how far and what you can do. But that was not necessarily the driving force. For me, I think the driving force was, it had been inculcated in my structure that I had to give something back to Ghana. Uh, my mom, bless her, even though she was from Barbados, yeah. would always say, look, you were educated in Ghana, <laughs> make sure you come and do I'll something for them. Yeah. So I always had the view that I had to come back home. Yeah. And so everything I did was actually geared towards knowing that I was going to come back home at some point in, sh in some shape, form, or fashion. And my dad passed away in 1994. In 1995, I joined the NDC. And was he NDC as well? My dad was not, there was no NDC, well, well there right. was, but he was not MPP. He came from the, he was an Krumahist. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so he was more maybe CPP inclined. Okay. Mm -hmm. But he was part of the Liman PMP group, and he was an MP under now. Uh, National Alliance of Liberals, way before your time, excuse me. Uh, and this was sometime in between 69 and 72. So he had always been inclined towards uh, the social democratic dispensation okay. political parties. And so that obviously influenced me up to a point. 
so then I joined in 95. I was uh, in London. I became uh, part of the communication group um, for the party. I became chairman of the party in London in 2000. And then in 2008, I came down to become campaign coordinator. So basically, those have been my, my teenage years and where I've progressed from. And once I came down in 2006, it was to uh, become the campaign coordinator to 2008. Yeah. I haven't looked back since. Amazing. Well, Amazing. fantastic. Uh, honestly, we wish that we could spend an extra 30 <laughs> minutes with you. But the, the few uh, five, six minutes we have left, we yeah. want to just try and uh, get some rapid responses from yeah. you, if I can say that. Yes. On, on, on some short game, we want to play with you. Yeah. Uh, interesting, <laughs> I know. Did yeah. I see your eyes <laughs> popping out? <laughs> they say, they yeah. say you should always be, pre be prepared, uh, as you rightly don't put it. Don't worry, he's a politician. Oh, Talk yeah. of it, a lawyer, my a goodness. Lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> I hope I don't get sued for this. Right? No. No. What about no. you start? No. No. All right, so I'm just, this is, this is just simple. We yeah. want to know, first of all, that uh, would you rather be invincible or you have super strength? Invincible. <laughs> okay, so that took you forever. I oh, wanted you want to stop. Yeah, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. I, right. okay. Jay? I'll, I'll. Well, okay. So if you could travel back in time, yes. what period would, would you go to? Oh, definitely 1960s. What happened there? The world was changing. I Anything you, went. I thought you had a girlfriend you loved then. <laughs> I was too young at that time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when you say the world was changing, what, what was how is it similar to what well, we're experiencing well, now? Well, yes, I mean, not be, you know, the, the Beatles, 60s, okay. all that ah, was happening. Right. You know, okay. the, the, the perspective of, of life okay. was changing. Was the, changing. The, the Cold War and things were, it, it was a very, intr f from what I read, I mean, yeah. I grew up, I was a kid, but... You know, I grew up, and you know, you, those days you had talent, James Brown yeah. and all. I mean, ah. you know, yeah. I grew up with listening, you know, to, listening yeah. to him and stuff. So from the music perspective and stuff. So yes, okay. early 60s. Now on a scale of one to 10, how good are you at keeping secrets? Very good. 10. <laughs> wow. <laughs> trusted, trusted person then. Oh, let, me say, let me be fair. Um, eight or nine. Eight or nine. Okay. Favorite junk food? Oh, uh... What's the definition of junk food here? Oh, you know, the, the regular, the, the one the, we get well, from uh, there. The, these fast food joints, so your fried rice, your fries. No, it should be between Wachi and Kelly Willie. Oh. <laughs> wow. Tell me the nickname your parents gave you when you were a child. I didn't have a nickname. Oh, no. the friends? Allegro. 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 Yes. Allegro. My, that, was, that was a school, my nickname at school. So all my brothers became Allegro after me. Place you <laughs> most want to travel to. Oh, wow, that's a, a very interesting one. But I w I've traveled a lot already. But uh, if I was asked, look, pick one place where you could go and, and, and have fun or just relax, yes. it would be somewhere in the Caribbean. That's wow. wow. Texting or talking? Talking. Why not? <laughs> the, the last one, a big one for you, if mm -hmm. we have time. Fill in the blank. President Ekufo Ado is? Late. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely late with the... With late the, in with implementing the, his exactly. policies. Yes, yes, not as in debt, no. No, no, yeah, no, 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 yeah. no, you understand. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so very much, honestly. I, I think we, I wish we had more time to delve into, you know, yeah. some of the things that you've done with regards to even the COVID-19 team with the, uh, on the NDC as well. Yeah. Um, but I'm very sure we have to get another time. We'll definitely invite you over. Thank you no so problem. much. Really I'm grateful. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. MFA? Right, so, uh, I mean, uh, I have a gift for you. It's soap anyway. When you're going, I'll mm -hmm. give you, okay. yes. Thank like they say that... Uh, so. I know that you are more education. expensive than crude oil now. Really? So, so, yeah, so soap is more in that need than... Uh, and the fact that you're so intense about education, the level of education about this COVID-19, yeah. uh, the hand-washing bits, we yes. encourage you as well. I think um, that's an area that we have to ramp up. Yes, yes. Well, fantastic. Yeah. Yes. All right, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for making a date. Make a date tomorrow as mm -hmm. well. Tomorrow's Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Good living. Do not miss it. Well, big thank you to Fan Milk as well for holding us down on Friday morning. And thank you very much. And birthday wishes to all of you out there who birthdays fall in the month of May. Thank see you to our Collections for my outfit. We'll see you tomorrow.